This talk is on liver function tests, and I have simplified it as much as I can. About liver function, the liver performs over 500 chemical processes, produces over 160 different proteins, makes clotting factors for the blood, stores and releases sugar as glycogen, metabolizes, detoxifies, synthesizes. Everything is done by the liver. That's why you can say that you can live without the brain. You can see a lot of examples around, but you can't uh, live without the liver. It's simply impossible. The word liver function test is actually a misnomer. We are actually measuring liver injury. It's not the liver function. The pattern of injury varies with the stage of the disease. And this is an important point, remember. A normal value that you get in a test is what 95% of normal asymptomatic people have. So just because one test is abnormal, don't have to bother too much about it. There is a 5% of the population on whom it is outside this normal range that's given in a lab. 2.5% of normal individuals have value above or below this normal range in any population. Right? Treat the patient and not the lab report. Very often you get normal lab reports and extensively investigate. So my suggestion is if you get one abnormal test on a well patient, on a medical checkup or something, don't do much, just repeat the test in a different lab or do it after a month or so. There are various patterns of liver injury. One is what reflects the parenchymal injury or necrosis, that is hepatocyte related. AST, ALT, and LDH are the three tests that tell you that pattern of injury. Reflecting hepatocyte synthetic function, short term is prothrombin, and medium term or long term is albumin. Reflecting bile acid injury or obstruction, bile duct injury or obstruction, is ALP, GGT, and 5 dax nucleotidase, which we don't do now. And lastly, we have tests that reflect the anionic transport across the hepatocyte, and that is bilirubin and bile acid. So these tests tell you the pattern of liver injury that is existing in, a in, in an individual patient. I will first go through the tests one by one before we look at the patterns. Amino transferases, you all know ALT and AST. We don't use the term SGPT and SDOT now. ALT is al almost exclusively in the cytosol of the liver. But AST is there in the heart, skeletal muscle, and blood. And therefore, ALT is more hepatospecific than AST. They are released from the hepatocytes when the cell is injured or necrosed. Levels will increase within 12 hours of a hepatocyte acute injury. And it peaks at 24 to 48 hours. And then it starts to decline. Extent of rise does not correlate with severity of the disease. That means if you find an ALT of 5,000, it doesn't mean that it's a very poor prognosis. It only tells you that a large number of hepatocytes has been suddenly damaged. It has no prognostic significance at all. A sudden fall in an ALT associated with a rising bilirubin and a prolonged prothrombin time, however, has a poor prognosis. Normally, when your ALT falls, your bilirubin should also fall and your prothrombin time should normalize. Whereas if your ALT falls, the other two are prolonging, it means there is in hepatocyte necrosis. And therefore, the enzymes are caught up in that necrosed area. AST, ALT ratio, very widely used in adults for alcoholic liver disease. In children, we use it only for Wilson's disease. Now, if you have a child who's sick and get an ALT above 1,000, these are the causes that should come to your mind. Acute viral hepatitis, Reis syndrome, autoimmune hepatitis, ischemic injury, and drug-induced. That's a sick child who's got a value above 1,000. Sick child whose values are below 1,000, think of chronic hepatitis, Wilson's and drugs, typhoid, malaria, dengue, leptospira, infectious pneumonia. That means non-hepatocyte diseases and, of course, metabolic diseases diseases as well. <coughs> if you have a well child whose ALT is elevated, think of a NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatosis, drugs, 
hepatitis B and C, which are chronic, and Wilson's disease. Remember, if an ALT is more than twice normal, only then it calls for an explanation. That means somebody has got an ALT of 41. It doesn't mean you need to go ahead and investigate. And if one to two times normal, you decide it case by case. Right? If there are something else, then you investigate. Otherwise, leave it. <coughs> what are the tests that reflect the synthetic function? Prothrombin time. I think all of you know about this. The factors are given there. They are a short half-life within 24 hours. So they are a good indicator of acute liver dysfunction. And today we use the term INR rather than the old prothrombin time. A prolonged prothrombin time which gets corrected with vitamin K indicates a better prognosis in a disease. That means the hepatocytes are able to extract the vitamin K from the blood and synthesize the clotting factors. Or it means it was an obstructive disease where there was a problem with absorption of vitamin K. It may also be prolonged in DIC. In which case, you will find that along with your prothrombin time, your PTT is also prolonged. So if you have a suspicion that this may be a non-hepatic disease, then you also do a PTT. In primary hepatic, the PTT will be normal, while only the PT is prolonged. Albumin has a half-life of three weeks, so it's a good indicator of chronic disease. Levels below three grams per cent are considered significant, but always roll out other causes of hypoalbuminemia. And uh, in that, you will get liver damage. I'm sorry. And the causes of low serum albumin are decreased synthesis from liver damage, insufficient protein intake or impaired digestion, protein loss from nephrotic or excessive burns, and shift into third space as in dengue and uh, ascites. So just because you get a low albumin, don't go primarily after liver disease. You should look out at other causes as well. Alkaline phosphatase, I think much has been talked about, that it's not very specific for the liver, and I made this point earlier, that uh, it's best done on a fasting state. But remember, age and gender and feeding all influence alkaline phosphatase levels. Low levels of alkaline phosphatase are seen in hypothyroidism, zinc deficiency, and pernicious anemia. Right? <clears throat> in, otherwise, in liver disease, we normally take high alkaline phosphatase as significant. In a bile duct disease, alkaline phosphatase is elevated in all those conditions that I have listed, and as well as in cirrhosis. But if you are not very sure this is a liver disease, also think of a growing child and rickets and chronic renal failure. GGT is much more specific. It's widely distributed, but it's not there in the bone. So for liver diseases today, GGT is far more important for us than, uh, than alkaline phosphatase. But please remember that neonates have a slightly higher alkaline phosphatase, up to about six months of age. 100 is taken as the cutoff. Adult values are reached by the age of three years. And values parallel ALP in most situations, except in BRIC and PFIC, which we talked about a little earlier. Serum bilirubin is a heme degradation product. 90% unconjugated bilirubin is lipid soluble, and therefore it is not seen in the urine. Conjugated bilirubin is water soluble and therefore it is filtered into the urine. So when you have unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia is why it stains the diaper or why we now say that color of the urine is far more easier to pick up for a mother than the color of the stool. Serum levels reflect an equilibrium. A bilirubin reflects an equilibrium between the rate of production, efficiency of conjugation, and excretion. There are three factors involved. So when a bilirubin is high, first decide which of these three it is. Is it a problem with increased production, a problem with flow into the bile, or is it a problem with conjugation? High bilirubin, I think you all know this, excessive load in hemolytic disease, defective transport as in hepatic esterification, or excretion is impaired because either because of hepatocellular damage or because there's an obstruction along the flow of bile in the biliary tree. Now let's look at patterns of injury. Let's look at a case. Here's a nine-year-old with vomiting and jaundice, soft, tender liver, four centimeters, spleen is not palpable, and there is free fluid present. These are the investigation, 6.4 with 1.2 direct. ALT is in thousands, AST is also in thousands. Albumin is 3.2, globulin is 2.6, 
ALP is 345, GGT is 54, prothrombin time is, INR is 1.2. What's your impression from this? <coughs> no, you can't say acute viral hepatitis. You can only say this is a hepatocellular pattern of injury. Right? This is a hepatocellular pattern of injury. Right? Now, what are the causes of hepatocellular pattern of injury? There are lots of them. Acute and chronic viral hepatitis, systemic infection, drugs, metabolic diseases, uncommon causes like rays, autoimmune state, all these. But this child has a hepatocellular pattern of injury, and you are looking at all these particular causes that we, are, we have put up on stage. Here's another child, 8-year-old child with, again, jaundice for 7 days, Soft liver, 2 centimeters, spleen, not palpable, no free fluid. And here is his LFT, 8.4 with 4.7 direct. ALT and AST are in hundreds. Albumin is 3.2. Alkaline phosphatase is 1,255. GGT is 121. INR is 1.6. What pattern of injury is this? This is a cholestatic pattern of injury. Right? ALP is high, GGT is 5, SDPT is... You will never get an absolute clear-cut picture. And what could be the various causes of cholestatic pattern? Common is cholestatic phase of acute viral hepatitis. Remember this. Children by the end of one week with acute he viral hepatitis will have cholestasis. And they come to you with this. Don't therefore go after the biliary tree. It's a cholestatic phase of acute hepatitis. Some drugs and extrahepatic biliary causes. Uncommon causes are infiltrative liver disease, parental nutrition, familial cholestasis, etc. But primarily, I want you to identify that this is a cholestatic pattern of liver injury. Here's another child, 8-year-old child with jaundice noted for 8 weeks. Firm liver, 4 centimeters, spleen is just palpable, no free fluid, total 8.4, direct 2.7, ALT is in 200s. Albumin is 2.2, alkaline phosphatase is 1,055, prothrombin time, INR is 1.4. What's your impression? See, the albumin is 2.2, a firm liver. So this is a chronic liver disease. You find everything is altered, right? ALP is altered, ALT is altered, everything is altered, but nothing very significant like the previous pattern. So here we would think of a chronic liver disease. What would come to your mind? Hepatitis B, Wilson's, drug-induced, autoimmune, steatohepatitis, and in older children, maybe 15 or 16, you should also think of hepatitis C. But this clearly is a chronic liver disease. Three-year-old child with persisting mild jaundice for three months, soft liver, two centimeters, spleen not palpable, no free fluid, bilirubin is 8.4, direct is 0 0.6, ALT 26, AST 15, Albumin is 3.2, ALP is 355, INR is 1.08. What's your diagnosis? Hemolysis. hemolysis, yeah, not extrahepatic. This is hemolytic anemia, maybe an inherited. This child had an inherited hyperbilirubinemia and a Gilbert syndrome. Now, this is a common, not an uncommon situation. And people go around repeating ultrasound after ultrasound to find something. Don't do that. This is inherited hyperbilirubinemia, and this is a hemolytic pattern of uh, presentation. What are some of the other tests of liver function? Ceruloplasmin is low level in Wilson's, but you don't use er ceruloplasmin alone in diagnosis of Wilson's disease. Alpha fetoprotein is useful only in two situations for us, tyrosinemia in young infants and in hepatocellular carcinomas. Hepatoblastoma also. Alpha-1 antitrypsin, I think the point's been made that we don't have it in India, but it may be low in alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. But again, serum level of alpha-1 levels is not useful for diagnosis of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. And this is a very important slide. What's the role of ultrasound? Please remember that ultrasound is very useful in picking up structural anomalies, space-occupying lesions, and in cirrhosis. It has very limited role in parenchymal disease. By the time you pick up something in parenchymal disease on the ultrasound, it's too late in the day. Don't depend on an ultrasound. I have seen very many patients who don't even come back to you because the ultrasound was reported as normal. 
Ultrasound is not a useful test for parenchymal disease for physicians. It may be quite useful for surgeons to roll out space-occupying lesions, hemangiomas, etc., etc. Therefore, do not give importance to ultrasound when you're looking at a parenchymal liver disease. Now, what's the carry home message that I have for you? Most liver diseases do not have the entire LFT as normal. By the time the entire LFT is abnormal, it's too late. You can't do anything by then. You need to pick up when the LFT is still in a treatable abnormal stage. A single abnormal test needs only follow-up. Remember the patterns of injury? Here I made it very simple. In practice, when you go back, it may not be this simple. But you can get a rough idea of what it is by looking at this. An abnormal pattern of injury needs a diagnosis. And if you can't make a diagnosis, please send it to somebody else. <laughs> An ultrasound is a very poor liver function test. Ultrasound is indeed not a liver function test. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. That was, that was really useful, really comprehensive, and thank you for sticking to time, really. So any questions or comments for John from the audience? Anybody else? Not a question, but in one of your slides, when you were showing the parenchymal liver disease, and when, when you were showing the CLD, there you showed the ASTLT to be a little high in hundreds, and then you said this is CLD. Truthfully, and most most CLDs, you may find the ASTLT to be completely normal. Could the be. students should not get this impression that the ASTLT has to be high for CLD. You no, not necessarily. You may only get it. Just depends on the stage of your CLD. And, and my point, and the, the, your last two slides, you were a little unfair to ultrasound. Why? I think he was being very fair to ultrasound. To me, <laughs> to me. In, in liver disease, the, the, the uh, importance of ultrasound also is when you see the size of the portal vein. Oh, yeah. I mean, that is, again, something. And even the ecogenicity, to some extent, will give you some idea about CLD. So the point that I'm trying to make is an ultrasound is a specialized investigation. Don't just use it as a part of an LFT. I mean, you need to look at specifically at the diameter of various this and things like that which on a routine ultrasound they are not going to do. Uh, uh, the point uh, here is to do to your, that. ah, the point, that's because I'm dealing with LFT. I do not want an ultrasound, a routine ultrasound to be used as a reassuring factor for parents and patients. And, and that's also, the point that I'm and I, I guess also John was also saying in the context that in your center, Seema, because your ultrasonographers are experienced in doing this day after day, it becomes easier for them. But from, if you send them to radiographers or uh, ultrasonologists who are not used to looking at pediatric livers, then it is a little bit difficult of their interpretation. Shouldn't we be asking and for it then? That's, 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 point that, that's, that's, that's what the point that I'm saying. Try, that's that what he was trying to make Often point. you find LFT that, ultrasound written together and sent. Yeah, and so the LFT is mildly abnormal, ultrasound is normal, then everybody is very happy about it. So I think what information we want from the ultrasound is very important for us. That we should for, ask for. for us. Yes. That's the point yes. that John was trying to make. Sorry, yes. Stand here, introduce yourself, you are making a good start. Uh, hello, Sam, Dr. Sonal. What is the role of fibrous scan uh, in nowadays? I mean, uh, in storage disorder, and what are the indications for that, and what is the actual use of it? Because we just get the amount of fibrosis in it, I mean. See, that is to evaluate the stage of a liver disease. It's not at a diagnostic phase. You want to know how much fibrous tissue is there, how is it progressing, is it responding to treatment, etc., etc. It doesn't come under any of these. So those are the, the patient who's got a liver disease, you've made a diagnosis, you want to follow it up, only then do you ask for a fibro scan. It's not a routine investigation. That's a specific test that you do. It's a little more expensive also. And it doesn't give you other information. They will only tell you what you ask for. So I, uh, would it be fair to say that if any lab has to give a good liver function test, they should include GGT, which often yes. labs do not, and they should ideally include INR, prothrombin time and INR. Yes. That would be a complete liver function test. Besides I think they should do three things. Yeah. One is to include lab normals for children, That's which doesn't happen. Yes. Second is to include a GGT as a must. But apparently when I've checked with the labs, they tell me that GGT is a little more difficult test to do. So the small time labs can't do a GGT. It's a little more difficult test to do. And INR again is, I think the problem is the INR is still with the 
pathologies, clinical, clinical pathologies, yes. while the rest of the LFT is with the biochemistry. Yes. So unless they, they finish uh, their fight, uh, collaborate we with are collaborating. Thank you. Thank you for this and thank you for all your comments. Well done. Thank you.